two. Let's get this party started. It's Dice Tower tonight, episode 53. Let the good times role play. Ah, welcome to Dice Tower Tonight, a video cast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On tonight's show, role playing and board gaming. Where is the dividing line? Are the hobbies really so different? And can't I make Kalis an RPG if I insist on speaking like a Renaissance nobleman the whole time? Also, I have a word game to play with Crystal and the chat. We talk about some recent play sessions, and we chat with the audience live. I'm Eric Summerer, and joining me now, the Wednesday to my Pugsley, Crystal Pisano. Very appropriate, considering we it is now October. Welcome I like to the October. Adams. Oh my gosh, I cannot believe it's October already. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's pretty crazy uh, how fast the year has gone by. I, I don't. We are like into the holiday uh, deluge, the slide. Uh, I, I, I just can't believe it's happening so quickly. And Essen is only a few weeks away. That, yeah, I, everything has just snuck up on me this year. Although I will say I'm very excited that it is now October because my friends and I are finally starting Betrayal Legacy this weekend. Uh, and we're going to be playing every Saturday in October, which feels very thematic. So that's That's some good planning to begin with. I like that. Uh, I just got back from a, uh, well, not just got back, but over the weekend, we had one of our local conventions, FallCon, in Stamford, which has become a, a family excursion for me. I bring both of my sons, and um, we teach various uh, games and uh, and just spend the weekend away while my wife gets to hang out by herself and go see the Downton Abbey movie and go see Dear Evan Hansen without um, child uh messing anything up so she gets to just hang out and have a nice weekend by herself and we went to the convention had a good time i didn't get to play a lot of new stuff um but i did get to play some favorites got to play uh defenders of the realm which i hadn't played in a long time introduced my youngest to that game and i think he had a good time uh so it was it was a good weekend all around um and and it's nice to see that the kids are sort of making friends and coming into their own in this gaming community as well which is pretty cool that, that is really neat. Uh, anything else exciting going on with you right now? I don't think so. Uh, I am. So we discussed a couple of weeks ago the fact that I need to cull my games. And I am toying with yep. the idea of turning that into a video series. Um, but hmm. I, I'm still unsure of how to manage it. Uh, I actually am considering something like in doing it in December, so it'd be like Colmas instead of Christmas, like <laughs> all across the month of December, where I go through cull culling all of my games. Uh, I don't know. I would love to hear suggestions from the chat if they have ideas for what kind of video series they would want to see from me about the process of culling my games. Um, and it needs to happen because okay. otherwise, my games are just going to sit around unculled forever. <laughs> So is it, it's like, you know, judgment time with Crystal and you just bring it, here's a game and it goes on the table and all right, keep or, or ditch. What am I doing? Yeah, with something this? like that. I'm picturing like piling all of the games I own into my loft and like doing a big shot of all of them. And then maybe even like a time lapse of me removing games <laughs> from the loft. Like it could be just as simple as that. Uh, or it could do, I could do the thing where that Tom does when he rates his games where he puts two on a table and Ooh. like. Maybe, like, two games that I'm, you know, like, iffy about getting rid of, and one yeah. has to go, or something like that. I don't okay. know. Okay. I mean, you could be super harsh, and, like, every installment, you take 20 games, and only 10 get to stay. I and, mean, and honestly, that... I feel like I could do that. And then eventually, I would cheat, and that would be fine, because it's my own rules. Well, so, sure. whatever. <laughs> and you could always have, like, wild cards that get to, you get to rescue a few. But that yeah. would be interesting to see what tough decisions you make. I don't know. Could be fun. I, the idea did enter my head to let the chat or the viewers vote on which games I got rid of. And then I immediately went, that's a horrible idea. I'm never doing that. You don't want to hate the chat. That would be, no. We we know that when given the choice, the chat will throw horrible games at us. So basically, I'm keeping... That is true. Based on what I know of the chat, I'm definitely keeping Adventure Time munchkin in my collection if they have their druthers which for the record <laughs> i have had a lot of fun with over the years so no munchkin hate from me but chances are it is going to go on the coal pile oh boy all right let's talk about some uh, new games that we've had a chance to play crystal i i have one um from pandasaurus games it's called mental blocks 
Ooh, this was at uh, Gen Con. This was at Gen Con. Uh, that, that was when it released. I got to play this for the first time at the retreat, the Dice Tower retreat. Mental Blocks is a cooperative, I guess puzzle game is the best way to, to describe it. Um, it contains a whole bunch of these different shaped blocks in different colors uh, and shapes as well. So you've got, um, there's a bunch of squares. They're all they're, they're like a light foam. They look like they might be wood, but they're they're actually a foam block. So it's not that heavy a game, because <laughs> like literally, it's not that heavy. Um, <laughs> and uh, so now I'm the problem is putting it all back together when you're all done. And then there's smaller blocks. Um, like there's some triangles and there's um, rectangles and all sorts of different shapes and colors um, that you will then combine into some sort of pattern. Each time you play, you're going to choose one particular puzzle, and I separated one of these puzzles to make it easier to grab. Um, there are 30 different puzzles, but the, the cards are two-sided, so it's actually 60 different puzzles in the box. Each puzzle has a whole array of cards. Um, the first four are basically orthogonal directions. So you'll be given this card. This is someone's view of the puzzle. But somebody else will have this view of the puzzle. And if you're playing with more than four players, you start to get some other cool views, like this 3D rendering of the puzzle. Oh! But you don't know from what direction any of these views are. Um, so your object is to then combine it into whatever it's going to be. And I apologize, this is the first puzzle. I'm not spoiling that much, I'm just going to flash it to the camera. Eventually, it's supposed to look like that, or something along those lines. Um, so that's the solution to the puzzle that you're trying to get to. Um... However, if it were just like, well, let's all just talk and move stuff around and I think we'll be able to figure this out, that would be a little too easy. The The tricky part is that they also give you some sort of uh, difficulty in the puzzle. Um, you might only be able to directly touch square blocks, or you may only directly touch black blocks. So then you're picking up black blocks and pointing at other stuff and poking other pieces around, and there's one in here that can't talk. You can touch all you want, but you're not allowed to talk. Um, there are other complications that you, you can add to make the game more difficult. Um, but that adds a nice little twist. This is a timed game. Um, so the timer's ticking down, and you're trying to uh, come up with, with this arrangement. And people are yelling, no, that doesn't... Whatever you just did messes my whole thing up. I, I need it to look like this. And, and trying to do that while only touching blue blocks is, is kind of tricky. Um... I found the first puzzle not not easy, but we managed to figure it out without too much trouble. But as soon as we got into the second puzzle, it got started to get really weird. And what we ended up with was nothing like what uh, the, the puzzle solution was supposed to be. So it can get very, very difficult. And if you want to add an extra um, layer into the whole thing, there is a possible traitor that can be in the game. Um, one of the players has the solution and is trying to mess everyone up uh, in, in positioning everything. I, I don't know if I'd want that much confusion in this game. Uh, I, I really like the production. Those foam blocks are solid. Um, they, they come with these mental blocks card sleeves that you're supposed to put the puzzle cards in so that you don't get confused and look at the wrong side. Uh, it keeps everything you know uniform. And it, they also have... Look at all these plastic bags. These were Holy all in the moly. box. There are 30 of these because each of the puzzles, if you want to separate them out, you could separate all, what is it, eight cards per puzzle into a bag. I haven't done that yet because I wanted to show you all the bags, but that's that's kind of a neat little um, additional element that they put in the box. Um, I never get mad at extra baggies. I no. will often not need them or use them, but I am never mad about it. And I am very frustrated when I open up a game and the components are in one of those non-resealable bags Arr! and they didn't provide baggies. Arr! Like, uh, yeah, that's the worst. I, but, I mean, really, there was a time that, that bags included in the game was was rare. I mean, we're, how spoiled are we now that we get mad when they don't have bags <laughs> for us? The answer is we're very spoiled. Right, exactly. And and who has it? You you have a box somewhere of bags in your house, right? You you probably have a supply waiting for those that don't give you bags. So anyway, um, mental blocks, 
really solid game, um, and and I, I'm looking forward to playing this. This is a really great team-building activity. Uh, I could see this showing up in various corporate uh, settings to to work on communication, because uh, there's a lot of lessons to be learned in here, too. But I look forward to playing it with my kids. Very cool. Yeah, we were at, so at Gen Con, the Dice Tower booth, we had a special promo for that game. So we had a lot of people who were picking it up uh, from the booth coming over to the Dice Tower booth. And every time I was like, ooh, that looks interesting. And so now you've made me want to try it even more. Yes, and now I need to pick up. I didn't actually get that promo because I didn't get a copy at Gen Con. But now that Pandasaurus has sent one, I, I now need to track that one down. Hopefully we still have some in the archive somewhere. I, I feel like we didn't run out at the con, but I don't know for sure. We'll see. Uh, yep. So here a couple of months ago, I don't remember if I mentioned it on stream or not, but I placed an order uh, online from Japanese Amazon, yes. which is something that I had never done before. Uh, a friend of mine told me that they had Let's Make a Bus Route on Japanese Amazon, and that is a game that I've played a whole bunch of times and was desperate to acquire, and it was for a reasonable price. So I went to buy it, and I said, well, if, if I'm here, I should look and see what else they have. Fun fact, searching on Japanese Amazon, even when you turn the language to English, not an easy task. Okay. <laughs> but I was able to, like, use Amazon's recommendations, like, oh, other people who bought the thing that you bought also like or purchase these things. And I kind of just went down a rabbit hole clicking through things on Amazon until I found something that looked interesting. And that thing was Guest Club. Uh, I do not know if that is an actual direct translation of the Japanese title or not, uh, but the English title of the game is Guest Club. It was published in 2017 uh, by Broadway Toys. Uh, it also was self-published at one point, uh, and the artwork was different when it was self-published. And it's designed by Sky Huang, um, who on Board Game Geek only has one other game credited to him um, or her. And it looks really interesting, too, so now I have to look up that one. So Guess Club is kind of unlike any other game I've ever played, which is... I think pretty rare. Um, it combines some things that you don't typically see combined in games. In this game, all of the players are given a set of cards that are uh, dry erase. So they are material that you can write on. And there are three rounds of the game. In each round, a category is chosen one of the players. And there are various rules in the rule books to how to determine who gets to choose what the categories are. Um, but you can pick anything you want as long as that category has at least 10 items within it. So, for instance, you could pick uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger movies or superheroes or colors or, you know, anything you want, uh, breakfast foods. Um, and then the players each take their six cards. Uh, oh, and the artwork on the cards is super great. They're all colored and figured the same but the like the poses of the figures on the cards are slightly different for oh, each wow. one yeah um just like but just barely um and of course <laughs> my favorite of all of the sets of cards it's my favorite color and it has a poodle on it which is one of my favorite types of dogs <laughs> so i'm and I'm, i always want to be purple anyway but when in this game it's like a must have because of the poodle um so you once somebody has determined what the category is, you take your dry erase marker and you write on the backs of your six cards six things that fit within that category, and then you put them in your card holder. And the card holder is important because you've got writing on all these cards, and if you were manipulating them in your hand or putting them together, the ink or the dry erase ink would potentially rub off. So everybody's got these cards in their hand. There is money in the pot in the middle of the table, a certain amount. Um, and there is always money in the pot. If the pot ever gets taken by somebody, then it gets replenished immediately with a certain amount. One player, or whoever the active player is, gets to choose whether they play a card from their hand or make a prediction. When you play a card from your hand, you take one of the cards. Let's say we had said colors, and I had written down the color red on this card. When I played that card, anyone else who also wrote down red has to play it right then. And that's considered to be a matching set. Okay. Um, and since it's a match, I believe I get to take the money in the pot because I played something that other people matched. Uh, if I play a card that no one matches, I actually have to put money into the pot. If I don't want to play a card from my hand, I can make a prediction. And that prediction, there's a track, whoop, which I'm going to grab so I can show you all. 
that has numbers on it. And you are placing a colored token of your own color onto the track. There's like zero, one, two, three, four, five. Sorry, the glare from my light is probably making that difficult to see. But you're predicting how many matching sets will occur before the round ends. So when I play red and other people played red, that's a matching set. If I play blue and no one else wrote down blue, that's not a matching set. Then the round ends when one player has no cards left in their hand. So this, there's this interesting thing where you want to write down things that are common or you think other people will write down because then when you play them, you won't have to put money into the pot but you also can theoretically write down less common things in hopes that there will be less matches throughout the course of the game and that you can predict maybe a lower number. Uh, you can make up to two predictions during the course of the round. You have two tokens that you can put predictions on and up to two players can predict the same number of matching sets. Um, I'm not explaining the money aspect super well just because it's a little confusing to explain succinctly, but you are collecting money for correct predictions and also matching sets throughout the course of the game, and whoever has the most money after three rounds wins. It is odd. It is fascinating, <laughs> and I really, I really enjoyed playing it. There is definitely, it's not deep, it is not highly strategic, and it's party game-esque, but it doesn't really feel like a party game either. I don't know. This feels like a chill party game. Like, it's not high energy necessarily. Although we did have some moments in the game that I played when uh, someone chose bands. Uh, someone wrote down a solo artist, and I was adamantly arguing that a solo artist is not a band. Like, those are two different things. And everybody was like, no, they have a band. And I was like, well, yeah, but that well, that's different. Every you, <laughs> you can't have a solo artist who's just singing a cappella. Well, unless Needle they're a solo a cappella artist. Right. Also, that somebody would like play a card with a band on it and nobody else played it. And they were like, wait, what? How could you not? And it's like, there's about a billion bands in the world and you only got to write down six. So <laughs> uh, Guess Club, which is not widely available in the States. And I apologize for that if I have interested anybody with it is very interesting um and i am looking forward to playing it more and i'm very happy that i picked this up because it's something unique no one in my game group owns this no one i, I would imagine i might be the only person in las vegas who owns this um it's not super common um and i think it was a good get on my part uh so yeah i'm very happy with my purchase um, from Japanese Amazon. And if anyone knows of other games on Japanese Amazon, let me know, because I'd be willing to place another order. But mm. that's it for Guess Club. Uh, based on my um, very old, at this point, knowledge of college Japanese, I think that is the actual title. That's Katakana on there, and it is, I think, okay. Gesu Kurabu. Guess Club. Oh, nice. So it's... it's oh, and I... Yeah. Uh, I, I will say... That while the game came with a rulebook, the rulebook was not in English. Uh, the rulebook that comes with the game, the printed edition of the game, is only in Japanese. No English rules whatsoever. Um, so I had to print off English rules from BGG, which I was very grateful that they were there. But the rules are in the same art style as the self-published version of the game. So there is a possibility that the rules I played with, while they worked with these components, they may actually differ from the published I do want to say that hmm. um, in case that matters to anybody. Um, but I could not find an actual English version of these rules. And for all I know, they are the same. But I can't guarantee that. So Interesting. Yeah. Cool. Uh, also, chat says it looked like you were eating a card taco while you were oh. playing that game. <laughs> I am. You know what? A cardboard taco? That sounds <laughs> um. delicious. Yeah, um, nom, nom, nom. <laughs> oh, no. It's a poodle taco. Not good. You don't want that. <laughs> look at those. Look at. Come on. Look at the poodle. Look at just. It's oh, so cute. <laughs> Too good. Too good. All right. Uh, it's time to play a game, Crystal. Are you ready for a game? Okay. I'm okay. definitely ready for a game. So this is, uh, I, I kind of like it sometimes when we get to adapt a, an existing game for our purposes and see how well it works. It, It's a little dangerous. I'm not sure how well it's going to work, but we're going to try to play Letter Jam today. Now, I know you, you have played Letter Jam before. In fact, you may have even talked about it here. I don't remember if we did or not. I, I'm not certain. I I'm, would imagine we at least mentioned it post-Gen Con. It has been one of my favorite acquisitions from Gen Con, 
and my most played game that I acquired at Gen Con in the two months prior or nice. since. <laughs> yeah, it's actually one of the games I taught at uh, Falcon, and my son played it and enjoyed it. So it's uh, it's it's hit the table uh, a good amount. In Letter Jam, for those that haven't played it, it is a cooperative game in which you are trying to get everyone to guess the letters that are in front of them by giving clues that incorporate as many of everyone's letters as possible. Um, we are going to play a modified version, in fact, a slightly easier version, frankly, because I don't know how well this is going to work. So, ordinarily, Letter Jam is played with a five-letter word in front of everyone, and you're all trying to get everyone to guess that entire set of five letters. We're going to play a three-letter word, and Crystal is the only one that we're trying to help out here. So let's um, move the webcam. Sorry if it gets anybody sick. We're going to travel over to my game show set. Welcome to Letter Jam. Wow! And we'll turn what, on the what, lights. What day, is, that, is that like a karaoke? Oh my gosh, what is that from? This is a Playmobil rock band set. And so I'm actually going to uh, also remove our graphics here so that um, we can't see or that we can see everything. Ta-da! All right, now. In Letter Jam, you are trying to guess these three letters. They do form a word, although I have scrambled them, so they are not necessarily forming a word right now. We're going to begin okay. by helping Crystal guess this letter. Now, there are five other letters that we can use, and there's also a wild letter that can be used in order to help make words. Um... Four-letter words would be better. Yes, thank you, chat. Um, so what's going to happen is that I'm going to give chat the letter that is behind this card, which I can see and Crystal cannot. Then I'm going to take the fifth suggestion for a word that utilizes Crystal's letter and as many of these as they can use, as well as one letter that can be wild, basically. This I has to represent. just use the asterisk to right. represent said wild letter. We can certainly do that. Okay. Because I don't think you're... Because you're not supposed to say what the actual... What letter you're using when you use the wild. You're just supposed to... Correct. Although I can okay. probably interpret that if I'm spelling out oh, the word. That's true. Yes. And I've uh, already hidden my chat. I popped out the chat from the window and hid the, the now popped out window. So I can't see the chat anymore. Perfectly. All right. So I'm going to give chat... Uh, the the letter that we're talking about, that, that is Crystal's letter, and then I'm going to take the fifth suggestion for a word that is going to get Crystal to guess the letter. Now, uh, since the regular structure of the game gives you, I think, like, 11 clues or something like that, we're going to give no more than six. Uh, if Crystal has decided she likes and, and knows what the letter is, we can move on to the next letter, um, and hopefully we can get her to guess correctly what these letters are within those six guesses. So... First, letter, Crystal's letter is, is right there. And I'm that, super okay. excited that we got a way to do this on stream. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, the, while, while chat is thinking, I am... Uh, the, the fun part about this game is that often a clue that seems like it makes sense in your head uh, is, is not necessarily the best clue for the situation. So uh, we have the first clue that has come in. I'm going to wait for number five. Number two has come in. And um, so there were many times that I, I thought a clue was perfect. Um, and there were like two options for letters. And then I found out, oh wait, there are actually two more letters that could fit into that word. And it made things particularly difficult. Okay. Yeah, I've had that same thing happen to me. <laughs> so, all right, here is, it is a three letter word. We're gonna keep things simple for this first one. Okay. The first one's gonna go there on the P. The second one is going to go on the U. And the third is your letter. Okay, so I, normally in this game, obviously you would not be talking things out because there are other players with letters in front of them, but since this is a video stream right. and there are no other players, I'm going to talk. So uh, things that immediately come to mind, uh, pug, pus, I think that's only spelled with one S. <laughs> um, I mean, pup is possible, but since there's already a P there, less likely... I mean, oh gosh, 
I, I'm not going to put the card down yet. I'm going to ask for another clue for okay. letter number one. So, but since uh, we want to have a little bit of variety here, so I'm going to remove the two letters that you got that you got. You okay. Got. So yep. we're going to uh, remove the U and the P, and we'll draw two new letters. We got an M, and we got a G. Oh, could oh could be an N. It could be pun. That would be very fitting considering what you and I do on a weekly basis here. Okay, so All we've right. got options. So I'm going to type in clue two. They're going to have to go for something longer because we're, we're potentially lacking vowels here. Well, we must be lacking vowels. Mine can't be a vowel. I don't so they might, they'll have to use the asterisk for a vowel, yep. meaning that only one vowel can be used in the words that they give. You can, and for the chat, if you've never played Letter Jam before, you can use the wild multiple times. You can use any letter multiple times. Yes. Um, but if you use the wild multiple times, it has to represent the same letter every time you use it. That so if it's correct. an E, then it has to be an E for the whole word every time you use it. I love this darn game so much. <laughs> <laughs> there were some, uh, there were some good suggestions on there. They just didn't happen to be the, uh, the one that was fifth. The fifth one. When okay, I I've got one. Oh, okay, we got one. Yep. I might have to just go for the third, so we're not just staring at it for a while. But <laughs> there were some good suggestions there. I think it's tough for chat because they, they want to be quick so they can get their answer in there. Right. But you want to take time to think of the best clue. I kind of like this second one. No, here we go. Here's a third. There's some lovely, lovely ones here. You should pick a lovely one. Who? I mean, we're, we make up the rules, right? Yeah. <laughs> here we go. I'm going to go with number four. Okay. I'm going to go with number four. I like number four. Okay. Uh, here we go. One. Number two is the wild. Okay. Three and four are your letter. Okay. And five is the Y. Okay. So, having three of the five letters be unknown to me does make it a little tough. But based on the previous rounds, S is definitely still possible because it could be messy. G is still possible because it could be muggy I think N and P are no longer viable options and I feel like somebody I think somebody was more likely to spell pug than pus like I think if I had an <laughs> S in front of me they would have it would pus wouldn't have been the thing somebody would have gone to so I'm going I'm not certain yet but I know that we have other letters to get to and hopefully they'll be able to help me out but I'm gonna I'm gonna guess that my letter it might be a G and I will say we can put that letter down and we can move on to the next one all right and then uh we'll find out later that I'm horribly wrong and it'll be amusing for everyone <laughs> ah. all right so I will also remove the M and the Y okay because we had those so now we have an H. I guess it could have been an N if it was like a name, because Manny, M-A-N-N-Y, technically possible. So and I'm not... S. Okay. New letter is... All right, I put the new letter in the chat. We have our new... Let me remove all these. But there were some very good clues in that uh, assortment. It is oh. fun to go back after the fact and look at, oh, the lights turned off. <laughs> My lights turned off. I mean, it has music, too. I could be... Um... I am delighted right now. <laughs> so there's actually all these Playmobil people, like a drum set and stuff that go there. Anyway, the, the things that my children have as toys. Anyway. I mean, I would have loved to have that as a toy when I was a kid. <laughs> All right, we have two clues in, uh, including one I really like. Third clue. Fourth clue. All right, the next one's going to happen. We're going to get the fourth one, fifth one. Okay, here we go. Oh, boy. 
I like it. That is a great one. Okay, this is a three or six letter clue. Okay. The longer ones do tend to be more informative, generally. All right. So, number one is H. Number two is the asterisk. Number three is M. Number four is your letter. Number five is also the asterisk. And number six is G. Oh, gosh. So, like, here's what, oof. like, it's six letters, but when I'm looking at this, I hope that, I don't know if that's going to be blurry or not. Yeah. It is hard to, like, so, obviously, the asterisk is representing a vowel. So, it should be obvious. Humbug. Wait. Humbug? <laughs> is that? Could that? I mean, there would be U's, and then my letter would be the B. Humbug. For the record, I recognize that that might not be it, and I could be way off. But you know, well, let's give myself more more chances on that last letter, just in case. So you want a uh, a second yeah, round on this one? Yeah, let's let's we we'll have two on each maybe just in case. But I feel like a B is my most most likely culprit at this point. All right, new letters. We have a C. yeah those those because when I see a G at the end of the word, I my brain immediately goes I N G, but obviously that's not the case here because that can't be an N before the G because then it would be H N M, which that doesn't spell anything. So. All right. So new set of clues. I'm trying to remember what the uh, the the word was that I had that ended up with four different possibilities. That it seemed like a really good clue, but. Um, some people suggesting that the clue might have been ham bag. Ham bag. <laughs> that sounds like something from Arrested Development because there's the hot ham water joke. So I feel like like one of the characters would have we can't be carrying a ham bag. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I just have four clues. I'm looking for number five, and number five is going to be right here. Is that how you spell that? I'm going to go with number six. All right, here we go. One. I have that moment a lot. And I was an English major, but in this game, somehow you begin to doubt everything you know about letters. All right, number one. Number one is your letter. Number two is the O. Number three is the L. Number four is the T. Number five is the S. Well, the B still fits. And I recognize there are other letters that could fit in that spot. In theory, it could be a V. It could be a C. It could be maybe something else. Oh, it could be an M. But I think I'm going to stick. I think it's probably a B. We'll find out, I guess, if I'm wrong. And we'll move on to letter number three. All right. Letter number three is here. And we remove the O, and the L, and the S, and the T. New letters. A whole new set. Oh boy, two S's. That doesn't help though, because then you just use the same one multiple right. times. I didn't actually say you had to replace it, but yeah, I like that better because really it's pointless to have the same letter out multiple times. Okay. The new letter is... There you go, chat. And we'll remove these. 
And ultimately, when this is all done, once you've uh, decided that, yes, you know what these letters are, you need to unscramble them into a, into a word. Um, which, yep. with three letters, shouldn't be too difficult. But the idea well, I... being that when you're yeah. done, you, you sort of reveal, here's the word I think it is, and, um, and then everyone laughs when it doesn't work like when it's that. not that yep um well i'm certainly hoping that this one is a vowel because if it isn't then i've done something horribly wrong all right we have three four looking for number five and okay that seems to be a popular cue clue that two and three four five and six your letter Two and three are C, four <laughs> is E, five and six is S. I know my letter! <laughs> That's such a good clue! Whoever gave that in chat, you get some kudos. That is that is a very good one. It also helps that they seem to be in order on the board. I mean, yeah, true. But I'm writing them down, so it wouldn't have mattered regardless. <laughs> Although, yeah, probably easier to like just think of. So do you think so... you, you have your, your selection figured out? I mean, if I am correct, my the letters in their current order are G, B, and A, which could theoretically spell gab or bag. Wait, you said this could spell four different things? <laughs> oh, no. I don't think I, I said that. Oh, okay. Maybe I thought maybe that's what I... Um, okay, well, I, I believe... So I'm going to have you put the letters. I'm going to have you move letter number one to the end. So in theory, this should now spell bag, B-A-G, if I am correct. <gasps> Ta-da! <Hooray! laughs> Crystal did it! Yay, chat did it with me. <laughs> you guys did an awesome job giving me clues. And that's, that's letter jam, uh, or a rather convoluted version of it. But nice job, everybody. That worked well. Yeah, that was super awesome. Okay. So, um, as far as stuff we wanted to talk about today, um, I just got back, as I said, from the, the convention FallCon, which it started as a role-playing convention. Um, a group of people that, that liked playing Dungeons & Dragons, and it became an event that was mostly role-playing for many years. And only in the last decade or so has the board gaming element of it grown and become such a big portion. Um, but it does mean there's still a, a very large contingent uh, of, of people who, who play the role-playing side of things. And it's, it's weird, there's this division, because there's the board gaming, it's held in a hotel, a Sheraton in Stamford, and the lower level is primarily board games, and then they have the mezzanine where all the role-players are. So there's, there's this real separation, that they're all up there playing their, their uh, role-playing games, and then down here are where the board gamers playing. Um, but my son, my youngest, the eight-year-old, made some friends who, uh, ha whose parents are in that role-playing contingent. And they asked him to play Dungeons & Dragons. They're like, hey, you want to play D&D? And he's like, okay, sure. And so they, they take him off to a table in the corner and they just throw him some dice and gave him a pre-made character and they just went off uh, and had a little adventure. And so then he's like, dad. I played D and D. I want to do this now. So we we got the uh, the twenty dollar starter set, which has a set of dice and a bunch of pre made characters and a basic adventure. Um, and he read none of that. He just opened the box, got the dice out, and immediately he just started. All right, Dad, you here's your character, and we're going on this adventure, and we're gonna go meet an ice dragon, and we're gonna do this. And he he just was off. On, I don't know what whether how much he picked up from the other kids or how much he was just doing himself, but it was impressive because I've always seen Dungeons and Dragons as this rule heavy experience. Like you got it, you got to have all these monster manuals and all this stuff. And he just took the basic concept and just ran with it. And we're gonna have this adventure now. Um, and it was, it was just really cool. I just sat back and just, let's see where this goes. I don't know where this is going to go. Um, and, and so it got me thinking about the, the, the division uh, between role-playing and, and board gaming and how there really isn't that much of it at this point with so many crossover products. And, uh, 
and and games that do have a significant role playing element to them. Absolutely. I well, first off, that story is delightful, <laughs> and I think it really illustrates how kids kind of this is a weird way of describing it, but they haven't developed that like fear of the unknown that we as adults sometimes have. I think for a lot of people, Dungeons and Dragons, if you've never played before and you are an adult, can seem daunting. Even if people are like, you know, people in the chat are saying that the starter kit is great and fifth edition it does a really good job of getting you into the game. But even with all of those things, I think a lot of people who've never played role playing games before go, ooh, I don't, I don't know. It seems like there's a lot and I, I can't do it. But kids, just hop right in. So that's really cool. It was really impressive. Um, so I, I don't, you, you have some notes that you wanted to talk about, but the one question that I have always sort of wondered, like where is the dividing line between what is a role-playing game and what's a board game? Is there an I answer mean, to that? I think, yes. I would say generally, well, oh gosh, I can't even, so... The term board game obviously implies that there is a board, but I use the term board game to describe lots of games that don't have boards, such as card games, for instance. I still refer right. to them as board games because I feel like they still fit within the same family. I think a role-playing game is less about the components and more about the experience, and board games often are definitely about an experience as well, but there is more weight to the components involved in facilitating that experience. That would be my quick off the top of my head way of differentiating the two on a very high level. Mm -hmm. I, um, I like uh, one of our, our, our chatters here said it can be a dotted line when you're talking about the line between the two hobbies. Absolutely. It's a porous I, line. It's a porous line. It's a very wiggly line, probably. <laughs> um, I had never played a role-playing game until about two years ago. Um, and this is when I was already very deep in the board gaming hobby and had always kind of had a curiosity about role-playing games. Uh, when I was in college, there were a group of friends and acquaintances of mine who got together on, I think, Friday nights and played some role-playing game. I don't even know if it was Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and I was an underclassman. They were upperclassmen, but I had a friend in the group. So I would sometimes come and watch them a little bit. Um, I don't remember if they invited me to join them or not. It seems like they had a very established thing going. So I don't think it was like a, they didn't purposely leave me out, but I am, I've, I've been a writer for most of my life and I believe I'm a pretty decent storyteller. So the idea of an RPG has always appealed to me. I had just never really had an opportunity to play one. And a couple of years ago, um, some podcasters that I knew through Slack and not board game podcasters, but just podcasters in general, um, were putting together a game of D&D &D for people who had never played before. And I said, hey, that's me. So I hopped in and ended up playing with a bunch of actual strangers. Like we did not know each other prior to playing D&D. &D, and we played every week for a little more than a year uh, before the campaign wrapped up. Okay. And um, we called it. They are still playing with other people now. Uh, some of the people that I was playing with. I had to stop because I, I'm i so busy. <laughs> and a year of that was a little bit much. Yeah. Um I also was playing in a monthly campaign that started a little bit after that with some of the uh, guys like Roy Canada, uh, who the Epic Gaming Night channel was running that stream, the monthly or the Epic Tales of Misplaced Meeples. Um, so I played in a monthly D&D campaign. And then I also still occasionally play in an ongoing Star Trek Adventures RPG with some of my online Star Trek friends who all also happen to be in the board game hobby. And nice. we are all huge Trek nerds. So that is a delight. I literally will take brown eyeliner and draw trill spots onto myself for our stream. And we don't stream it live anywhere. No one is watching except for the people I'm playing with. But I really like to get into character and I'm a joint trill in the game. So I, it's fun to do. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Um, a, a few people talking about some games that have 
RPG elements. There's lots of board games that that have RPG elements, Mice and Mystics, uh, Arkham Horror, um, that that have sort of a, a sense of the the tropes of role playing, stats and skill checks and that sort of thing. The Pathfinder Adventure card game, but they they tend to lack the role playing aspect of of the role playing. Uh, it, there, there's not a lot of acting involved in. Um, in the the board game versions of RPGs, uh, and in fact, there are some of these that I've played with friends who do play role playing games that say, you know, why don't I just play a role playing game? If I'm going to do something that's almost an RPG, why am I not just doing an RPG? Um, although you can play a role playing game purely mechanically, you could just say, let's go on adve- an adventure and we'll do this skill check against this monster and not not put the trill dots on your head or <laughs> Or dress in costume, or speak in funny accents, or all of the stuff that that are often tropes of role playing games. I so I would actually disagree about that. Well, why don't I just play a role playing game? Because I think that there are certain board games that lend themselves to role playing aspects that aren't necessarily included in the rules, but I that the enha- the experience is enhanced if you are willing to role play it. The best example of this that I can think of, and again, this is not in the rule book at all, but Sheriff of Nottingham is 1,000 times better if the person who is embodying the sheriff each round gets yeah. into character. And when I play this game, I like to be the sheriff first because then it helps set the tone for the game. And I will immediately, yeah. as soon as we start the game and people slide their bags over to me, I get angry. <laughs> and I'm like, what is this? I see there are no coins on any of these bags. Like I want them to pay me just for the privilege of me even considering their bags. And people get shook. They literally are like, whoa, <laughs> like Crystal's intense right now. But it like, it's so, because you you have to think the Sheriff of Nottingham would just not be like robotically deciding to open or not open things. He would be a jerk about it. Right. And honestly, yeah, yeah. I, I consider myself to be a mostly pretty nice person, and it's really fun to be a jerk for just a few minutes. And that's what role playing does. It allows you to step outside of yourself for a minute. And I yeah. know that not everyone is comfortable with that, but um, it's so much fun to do. Fog of Love is another example. Role playing in Fog of Love makes the game a lot more interesting as well. Hmm. Especially when you you and your partner are having to kind of decide on a very tough decision. Um, And it actually, that can get really intense in that game because some of the topics that you're dealing with are very serious. So that is less, it's fun, but in a very different way. Um, So I think there are some board games that are really enhanced by people being willing to throw in the aspects of role-playing. That's true. Uh, one of the, the best games of Colosseum I've better, ever been involved with is when we basically made it an improv game describing what each of the shows were. Yeah, we were doing it mechanically and collecting tiles and presenting a show with these tiles, but then we had to describe what the show was, um, and, and that add a whole another layer to this. And and Sheriff is another great example. I played a game with Chris Leader, uh, the designer of Roll For It, um, who is a very fun guy to play games with, and his Sheriff was also very intimidating. It's just so much fun to surprise people with that kind of stuff. And then in future rounds of Sheriff, like when people, when I'm the Sheriff in future rounds, people will just put a coin on their bag before they give it to me because they don't want me to get angry. <laughs> And, you know, one player won't, and then I can just be all indignant about that one player, and there's a lot of meta in that game about whether you're going to open people's bags or not, and if they bribe you, does that mean that they have contraband in their bag? So the role-playing really, like, makes the game shine. And you can play Sheriff of Nottingham without that stuff, but... I, every time I've told people about that game or introduced it to them, I tell, suggest them role play the heck out of the role of the sheriff because it makes it so much more enjoyable. So do you think that maybe um, for people who are reluctant to try out a role playing game, do you think that aspect of it keeps them away from trying, would, say, d and I would say yes. I would say there are probably... The two things that I would imagine keep a lot of people away from trying RPGs would be... The rules have the th- the thought that they are rules heavy, um, and in some instances that is not an inaccurate assumption. Um, 
And then the fear of not being able to improv. Uh, improv is a very difficult thing to do. People who do improv well often have studied for years to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, fun fact, I was in an improv troupe in high school and my improv name was Q-Dog and dog was spelled D-A-W-G. <laughs> That was my improv name. I don't have any idea why I ch well, the Q was because my la my maiden name started with a Q. Yes, you have a question, Eric? I was going to ask what the Q was for. Okay, yes. You know, my maiden name started with a Q. Um, so yeah, that was the Q. But I why dog, D-A-W-G? That was my know. second question. Why yeah, D-A-W-G? I, I mean, I like dogs, but I don't think that that had anything to do with it. Needless to say... Here, here's a tiny little aside that is very related to role-playing games. If you are a person who likes trying new things, taking an improv class can actually be a lot of fun and will benefit you in ways that you did not know, such as presentation skills at work or yeah, the ability yeah. to podcast or make videos on YouTube. There are a lot of things that improv will help you with, uh, and it'll give you a little bit more self-confidence likely as well. So I would suggest if anybody's ever considered taking an improv class, do it 100%. And it may be tough or uncomfortable, but if you can find the right group, oh gosh, I hit the mic, I'm so sorry, hopefully that wasn't loud. I'm gesturing wildly, which they tell you to do in an improv <laughs> class. Um, yeah, so uh, improv, good for role playing, can be intimidating though, if you've never done it before. Uh, Halix in the chat says, I even role play in Mansions of Madness. A friend and I both chose older characters and we played like we were an old bickering couple. <laughs> did you go down the hall? No. <laughs> Wait, did you? I said, did you go down the hall? <laughs> You're always opening the cursed objects. Why? 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 I told you that chest looks suspicious and you never listened to me. <laughs> I told you to stick with the group. Don't no, you... her off. So uh, something that I wanted to bring up, I think that a lot of people might not be aware that like, so, so when you say role playing, I think most people's brains immediately go to Dungeons and Dragons. And that is for good reason. It has been around for a long time. And there are versions of it that are, that are very approachable. And it's kind of the most well known RPG, but there are lots of other RPGs. So if you let's say you have a specific love for an intellectual property for me, that's Star Trek. Uh, maybe you, for you, it's Star Wars. There are a lot of RPGs set in intellectual property based worlds that are really good. I think there's even like a Firefly RPG. So if you like Firefly, there's something there. So if there's an intellectual property that you really like, that might be a good starting place because you're already kind of familiar with the world. So you're not coming in completely blind. Um, and another suggestion that I would make is rather than starting a campaign based RPG, look for a one shot RPG that is small with a smaller rule set and you can play in a single session. I have played a game of Honey Heist before, which is a role-playing game where all of the characters are bears attempting to heist something. <laughs> and the only things you can do in the game are bear things or criminal things. And so if you do something that a bear couldn't normally do, it's considered to be a criminal thing. And you have to balance your bear actions with your criminal actions. And it is hilarious. The rules are literally a single piece of paper. Your sheet is a single piece of paper. Um, so if you want to try an RPG, I think those are a good place to start. There's a lot of one-shot RPGs. Uh, Ten Candles is another one. Fiasco, Dread, uh, Everyone is John. I mean, there's tons of them out there. Those are some of the ones that I am aware of. Um, yeah. And I haven't actually played a lot of them, but like Everyone is John is one that's kind of interested me for a long time. Yeah, that's a good thing to do at a convention, uh, at least one that has a good breadth of, of events. Um, some of the smaller conventions will pretty much just stick with D&D and Pathfinder. But you can usually find at one of these events some of these one-off uh, events because somebody wants to do something that, that's a little different and quirky and silly. Uh, there are some that are about stuffed animals. There are some where your character is made out of clay. Um, there are some where... There are, which one is it that uses the Jenga Tower? as the combat oh, resolution uh, yeah dread i believe uses the jenga tower although there might be others that do it as well um so something you know at a convention if you have an open slot or you know a couple of hours to spend doing something a little different a convention is great because you'll get someone who 
knows the system well and is is ready to uh, present it in a way to get people involved, knowing that it's a quirky, out of you know non non standard adventure, and so they're going to be wanting to bring people into it and and really bring the theme out. I mean, we just need someone to design a weird out like a, a UHF RPG. <laughs> that is, I want like Stanley Spadowski in in my RPG. <laughs> <laughs> Stanley Spadowski's Clubhouse RPG. Yeah, I'm gonna start typing immediately. <laughs> We're gonna make it. <laughs> oh gosh. Yep. Uh, so, I think there's a Stargate yeah. RPG too. That that would be fun to track down someday. Ooh, okay. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, I honestly, I bet there's a lot of, especially fan made RPGs. Maybe not officially published things, but yeah. I would bet that if you really love an IP, somebody has written a role playing scenario for it. Or what's interesting is sometimes people write stories set in specific IPs, but for existing systems like Dungeons and Dragons. So you can find a story set in a specific universe that's not licensed, but you can use in a different system like Dungeons and Dragons. So those right. are something to look out for as well. Indeed. What uh, What is it? The D20 system. Um, I right. think at one point Dungeons and Dragons allowed their system to be used for other things. Um, that was, I think, some time ago. But they, there was this sort of open source, use our system to do cool stuff uh, period of time. Kabuki Kid says the only RPG they ever played was Star Trek, but that was back in the mid-90s. I will say I did not play an RPG of Star Trek back then. Star Trek Adventures, their newer one, is delightful, and I actually like the dice rolling system far more than Dungeons & Dragons. And that has nothing to do with my love of the IP. I really like the 2D20 system way more. Um, and you're looking for low numbers, not high numbers, which is interesting if you try and switch back and forth between those two games in a short <laughs> span, which I have done in the past. Yep. Uh, Rick Thompson says there is a new Stargate RPG coming out next year. It uses a system similar to Dungeons and Dragons. Hmm. Very cool. Very cool. Well, we have a few minutes left. Um, if anyone has questions for us about RPG, or board games or anything, feel free to drop them in the chat. And while you're thinking of a brilliant question to ask us, make sure you click that little thumbs up button below the video for me, please, because it helps with our YouTube algorithms and it makes me very happy. And we have three thumbs downs already. I How is that even possible? I don't know. <laughs> I know. I love that people click into the stream just to say, I don't like this thing. I, it, I mean, part of me wants to know why, but part of me probably doesn't want to know why. I mean, there is no reason why is the answer, basically. Uh, so what and is we, on the horizon yeah. for us, Crystal, in the next few weeks? Between now and when we get to speak again, I'm looking at the calendar. I don't think I have anything, like, super major going on in the next couple of weeks. Um, so um, We'll be back. Next time we get to talk, we'll be right before I leave for Spiel. Um, okay. And, and then we'll yeah. get to talk after Spiel. That'll be fun, too. Yep. I just did my live stream this past Sunday. If anybody wants to watch that, that is here on the Dice Towers YouTube channel. Um, I do that the last Sunday of every month. Um, and this one was a fun one. I really enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, but yeah, so in, b between now and then, I don't have anything specific going on. Aside from starting that Betrayal Legacy game, um, which I am very excited about. So maybe in two weeks, I can provide some non-spoiler initial thoughts at that point i will have played on two different saturdays i'm not certain how many games we're going to play in each session um because i don't know how long they take um but my best my best guess would be two to three a night maybe we'll see um wow. okay. so i will have i will have a few games under my belt at that point for sure okay uh nick asks what are your favorite tile laying games crystal Ooh, that's a good one tile laying um, well, I just recently played Legendary Forests for the first time, and it is delightful. Um, I, I haven't played Carcassonne in a long time, but Carcassonne is still great. Um, I guess Karuba would be considered a tile-laying game, probably. Yep, yep. Um, it's hard for me to think of games with a specific mechanic off the top of my head. So let's go to the games that I own on Board Game Geek and take a look and see. Do you have any that you really like? Uh, one that's a classic is called Ent Decker. 
Um, you're, you're building islands on a grid, and you have to sail from different ends of the board. So, like, the bottom of the board, you can sail off for free, but then if you want to get, like, from the sides or from the top, where you can reach things more quickly, you have to pay money, um, and then you have to pay for each tile that you draw, and if you manage to get to an island with the with the tiles that you draw it's a little bit of a like push your luck or a betting game how much do i invest on this particular journey and then if i reach something i can then claim it uh put one of my explorers on it or even a building uh that will hopefully win me majority when that island completes um i like it okay very cool did you find any others in your list i'm not necessarily it's like I definitely there are games that have tiles in them. I mean, like Betrayal is a good example of there are tiles in that game, but it's not really a tile laying game. Um, yeah, I don't know if maybe if tile laying is something that I don't gravitate toward that much, mm -hmm. or I'm just not thinking of the ones that I would count. Like would I think Hugh the Paco game game with mm. the colored blocks that would probably be considered a tile laying game would be my guess and I really yeah. like that. Yeah, I think so. Um, it's just weird because they're not tiles; they're cards. <laughs> sure. Uh, ooh, and that being the case, Sprawlopolis. I'm gonna count. Yes. As a tile laying game, and probably one of, if not my actual favorite tile laying yeah. game. Sprawlopolis is mind blowingly good, considering it is 18 cards. I continue to be astounded by it and like it's not just that it's 18 cards it's 18 cards that you can play with between one and four players and it works at all of those player counts equally yeah. well yeah. i just so good i agree i i actually brought that out uh, with a friend recently and he ran out and bought his own copy so it's it's spreading the word for sure i am excited because i got my shipping notification for my copy of tussy mussy from oh. one shop and it is arriving soon. So. I, I did not back uh, Tussie Mussie, but I'm hoping that they have copies at PAX because they were at Buttonshy was at PAX last year. So I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that they'll be there and I can uh, at least demo it, if not grab a copy for myself. I mean, I, regardless, of, well, if if they're there, I would be shocked if they did not have copies of it because probably it's you know Elizabeth Hargrave is uh, yeah kind of blowing up right now rightfully yep. so yep yep uh have you had a chance to look at any of the games coming out at essen crystal you know i really haven't um i just haven't even looked at the list yet so i should probably do that uh i actually it was funny today i saw the link on board game geek to look at the preview list and i was like "Ooh, i should do that and then i was like "Ooh, maybe i shouldn't because i'm not gonna <laughs> be there and what I, what inevitably will end up happening is I'll pre-order something and make one of like one of you all from the dice tower or somebody else pick it up for me. Like I don't think I have any friends here in Vegas who are going to Essen. I don't know if Tim is going to Essen or not. Maybe he is. Maybe. I don't know. I don't I don't like the idea of making people mule games for me. Um, like even if they have space, it just seems like a hassle. Yeah, it is. It, I mean, space fills up very quickly uh, in that situation. Um, and I and found that out. Hard way at Gen Con. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When you're suddenly uh, having to break down boxes and ship them home, and uh, yeah, that's have to bring the the travel scale to make sure you can actually get it home. Yes, uh, I have not. I I have been sifting through the list, but um, it's it's something like a thousand or eleven hundred entries. Although many of those are in languages other than English, so it, you have to sort of sift those out. Um, but we will be having, for the Dice Tower podcast, um, a preview episode coming up in a few weeks. So I need to have a sense of what I'm looking at. The only ones I've looked at so far that have stood out are a couple of cooperative games. One called Mourn Quest, M-O-U-R-N-E. Uh, the publisher is Backspindle Games. It's based on, like, a German... I think it's based on a, a, a literary property that I'm unfamiliar with, but it really struck me as an interesting world in the description of the game. Um, and, and it's, you know, magic swords and sorcery court sort of thing. Um, and it, it looked like it would be an interesting exploration for me and my kids. <laughs> I will say that the second you said the name of the game before you spelled it, the Morn made me think of the character from Deep Space Nine who sits at the bar and never speaks through the whole series. And I was like, 
mourn quest. Like, I want <laughs> that game. Please. I, my husband's actually watching Deep Space Nine for the first time right now. And early on, I pointed mourn out to him. And I was like, keep an eye out for that guy. He's very important. And Rob keeps being like, what is the deal with mourn? I'm like, there's no deal. He's just going to be there the whole time. <laughs> Oh. So uh, what else what else caught your eye? Oh, the, the other one is called Popper's Ladder um from Bedsit Games. And again, I've I've just been writing down a list. So I I haven't really explored much further than ooh, that's a co-op that sounds cool. I think I flagged all the cooperative games and all of the pick up and deliver games and sifted through those first and now I need to go through everything else. Okay. Um but yeah, there's well, there's still more research to do for sure. Definitely. Well, I imagine that there are going to be a lot of exciting things coming out at Essen, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to get my hands on a few of them after the fact. Um, but I, I'm very excited for you all to get to go. I'm a little sad that I'm not going, but also glad that I don't have to fly halfway across the world, because <laughs> that's a lot of traveling. It is. Um, it's, but, a, it's a great but journey, be... but it's, it's, it's long. And really, I feel like I would feel worse if I wasn't doing anything else until Dice Tower Cruise. But since I am going to PAX Unplugged now, I have something to look forward to. And I am very much looking forward to PAX Unplugged. Um, there may be some shenanigans at PAX Unplugged that I'm going to be involved in that people will be very excited about. But I haven't confirmed. Nothing is quite confirmed yet. So I keep hearing I'm rumors excited. of shenanigans. and I mean, I mean, it's, yeah, shenanigans for sure. Sh should I be worried? I <laughs> Nah, okay. you'll be excited about these shenanigans. Oh, good. I like so. I like to be excited about shenanigans. Well, it looks like the chat, the questions in the chat have kind of tapered off. Do you have any final thoughts that you want to share about anything before we sign out? Uh, I'd, I'd like to try more role-playing games, and I'm excited to, to see what my son comes up with. I've, I've suggested that he actually read the rules now. Um, but and, and both of my kids are now arguing over who gets to DM the first real adventure. So I, I'm pretty sure we try and rotate who gets to decide what we do on game night. And I think when it's my youngest's turn next, we're playing some D&D. &D. Well, that's pretty exciting. Um, I actually, I think it would be fun for the whole Dice Tower crew to play maybe a short one-shot RPG together at some point, maybe as a live show of some kind or something like that. I know RPGs tend to be kind of long, but uh, I imagine that would be an enjoyable experience. So yeah. maybe yeah. maybe that's something to add to the potential list for the future. That would be fun. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you all so much for watching. Uh, again, if you haven't yet, please click that thumbs up button video. <laughs> click the thumbs up video click the thumbs up button below the video uh and we appreciate it um we will join you again in two weeks at 6 p.m pacific 9 p.m eastern and that date so i will look is october 16th will be our next episode but until then i am crystal pisano and i'm eric summerer and you've been watching dice tower tonight Thanks for watching. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. Crystal and I will see you in two weeks for another installment. Our show is supported by viewers like you. Thank you. Dice Tower Tonight is produced by Crystal and me with assistance from Tom Vassell, Chris Barr, Roy Kennedy, and Rob Searing. Our VCR Horror Game Marathon on December 24th provided by The Nightmare Before Christmas. <laughs> Timothy Pinkham composed our theme and hosting is provided by Cool Stuff Inc where you can find great games at great prices at CoolStuffInc.com Give us your feedback on the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek on Facebook or Twitter or by emailing us at Dicetower at gmail.com And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network Find something new at Dicetowernetwork.com Until next time from all of us at the Dice Tower Have fun gaming Have fun gaming, gaming. <laughs> That one was delightful, and now I want to stream Atmosphere on the Dice Tower this month since it's October. I want to make that happen. I don't know. I'm going to have to work on that. But I, I'm surprised yeah. no one has. I, I'm, yeah, that would be entertaining. I mean, Tom will roll his eyes when I suggest it, and that is always one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. Bye.